to be joined. Um, I'm so excited for this conversation this evening to um, uh, have the Alice Austin House, which is a, if you aren't familiar with us, we are a small historic house museum located on the waterfront of Staten Island. We are a nationally designated site of LGBTQ history because of our namesake, who was a brilliant photographer, Alice Austin. She was born in 1866 and lived until 1952. And she was a lesbian woman who broke all of the rules of what was the norms for Victorian women's behavior. And she had a loving relationship with her partner, Gertrude Tate, for 56 years. And 30 of those years were spent living together at the Alice Austin house, where she maintained her dark room. Um, and really that house was a muse for Alice Austin. It's really um, such a wonderful journey that I can say personally that I've had uh, getting to know Jeb um, and that the Alice Austin House has had with um, our relationship with Jeb. And before we get into tonight's whole slideshow, I did want to give some context to that because back in 2017, um, the Alice Austin House which hasn't always, as a museum, um, honored Alice Austin's truthful life and le her full legacy. Um, it was making great strides to repair that really broken history and the hurt that they had actually caused to the LGBTQ community. And as a part of that work, we were amending our landmark designation status which was awarded to us the amendment um, as a nationally designated site of LGBTQ history. And as a part of our celebrations, Jeb came to the Alice Austin house. And I had the pleasure of picking Jeb up from the ferry. I was not, my name's Victoria Munro, by the way. I get so excited when I get to talk to Jeb, I forget to introduce myself. Um, and I'm the executive director of the Alice Austin House, but I wasn't back then. I was a teaching artist and I was hired to write women's history programming for the house. And so I was uh, tasked with the duty of picking up Jeb, which was an amazing and delightful and incredible experience. And I was actually a little bit nervous. <laughs> and, and that day, Jeb helped us with all of our celebrations, whether it be uh, announcing the designation and making one of the most powerful speeches that I think I've ever heard in my life, um, to that evening um, presenting a portion of her very famous dyke show on our lawn. Um, it was an incredible experience and I actually got to see two photographs that Alice Austin had taken to commemorate a trip that she and Gertrude had in 1899 that I had never seen before. So all of this was really such a revolution for me and such a connecting experience. I have to say that my first trip to the Alice Austin house had been about 10 years previous and I left not knowing that Austin was a photographer and I certainly didn't know that she was a lesbian. Now, as a, as a lesbian and as an artist who often works with the medium of photography, that might have been really, really important to me. So I'm just so thrilled that today we can celebrate that moment, but ha take this moment to talk to Jeb about her recent process of digitizing the Dyke Show. And she's gonna do most of the talking, believe me. And you know, this talk coincides with an incredibly wonderful exhibition that is curated by Ariel Goldberg at the Leslie Lohman Museum. And it should be, if you haven't seen it, it should be top on your list to go and see. Um, and so, I really wanted to take this opportunity to provide a platform for Jeb 
to discuss how this process evolved and the kind of supports that she might have had along the way and all of the work that she's put into it, but also how she even came to creating the Dyke Show, which we know is, was absolutely crucial in terms of lesbian visibility. So welcome, Jeb. Thank you so much for allowing that slightly long introduction. Um, well, thank you for inviting me, Victoria. You know, I'm so fond of the Alice Austin House and everything we do together. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I did want to say a couple of things before I started in on the Dyke Show. Um, happy Lesbian Visibility Week to everyone. And um, as you might guess, I've thought about visibility a lot. So I have one thing I'd like to say about Lesbian Visibility Week, which is that I hope we all understand that not everybody can be visible, that it is not safe for some people to be visible, and that it's not good for us to judge that because usually it's because of the amount of power and privilege that a person has because of their class or their race or their gender identity that makes things more dangerous for them. So let's be as visible as we can and uh, as safe as we can and work toward the day when it will be safe for everybody to be visible as who they really are. Secondly, it's a big day uh, for me uh, because on April 25th in 1993, I was the video director for the 1993 March on Washington for Lesbian, Gay, and Bi Equal Rights and Liberation, which was a massive, huge march. And I was like the Wizard of Oz sitting in my own little tent with all the tech and we had all the jumbotrons on the mall. And anyway, it was terrific. And if you want to learn more about that march, please uh, see my film, which is called The Simple Matter of Justice. And you can get that from Frameline. Um, yes. So I also want to say briefly that I'm coming to you uh, from my home office, uh, which is outside of Washington, D.C., on the traditional homelands of the uh, Piscataway Indian tribe and the Piscataway Conway tribe. And uh, this is stolen, unceded uh, land that was removed those people, European settler colonialists removed the Piscataway people, and they've fortunately been able to return, uh, you know, some of them. And in any case, I just want to say that whenever I make a land acknowledgement, I also donate to an Indigenous-led uh, organization, and I've done that tonight. Okay. So... So I think that we're going to start with some images and I uh, we're going to start with the, the images that I told you about that I saw um, when Jeb presented the portion of the Dyke Show at the Alice Austin House. Um, I was flabbergasted that you had never seen these. And these are images, of course, that I found when I was doing my research for the Dyke Show in the 70s. And I came to Staten Island, to the Staten Island Historical Society and found this little album and, and made these pictures, which are in the slideshow. So, so to tell the story of them. Yes, so this album was then subsequently purchased by the Alice Austin House from the Historical Society, and it 
was in our collections room and as a person that was writing education programs for the Alice Austin House, I'd never been invited to the collections room to see the album. I knew of this album's existence, but I had no idea of its contents. And at that time, nothing really had been digitized. And what we were offering on our website was certainly not from our own collection. So I think I, I realized at that moment when Jeb was you know delivering this incredible slideshow that I was woefully under resourced to even correctly do my job um and of course this was one of the first things that I asked to see um after after that moment and I also of course realized on that evening um that Jeb would be an ally for me um moving forward and I was to become that year the executive director and her mentorship um, and advice have been crucial to me every year along the this journey which I'm now nearly in my sixth year but so within this album there's this incredible image there's two images one with Gertrude sitting here pictured by Alice in this rocking chair, they're in the Catskills um, at a place um, called Twilight Rest. And if you'd like to go to the next slide, we see this incredible image of Gertrude with her wig off for Alice, um, definitely at Alice's request, or perhaps they both planned it and it shows so much trust. Um, Gertrude was recovering from typhoid and um, she had lost a lot of her hair and so therefore was wearing a wig during this time. We had also believed that this was the first time that Alice and Gertrude met, but we now know um, that they met three years earlier. And this is through new research that has been done. COVID allowed us the pause to digitize these items. So they're available to you on our website now. Um, Yes, and it's but these are an incredible set of images that are really moving. And um, in 2018, I asked Jeb to contribute to a show called Fine Bright Day um, that was uh, for the center it, at, in Manhattan, the LGBT center. And I asked Jeb if she would contribute a text to describe these two photographs. Um, so that's a wonderful show that you can also see a virtual version on our website because we decided to uh, present it at the Alice Austin House um, at the end of last year and at the beginning of this year. So the whole catalog's available to you on the website. And now I'd really like Jeb to take it away. Okay. So we uh, next slide, please. Imagine that uh, you are a lesbian in the 1970s. You've come out, you're looking for your history. You want to see the lesbians who came before you and you can't find any photographs that aren't either sort of pornography for men or, I mean, that was basically it or, you know, in psychiatry books saying we're sick. So I decided I wanted to have photographs that looked like the lesbians I knew. So I started to, um, I, I became a photographer. I taught myself how to do this. And then I went all uh, around the country as much as I could. And I decided to publish this book in 1979. And next, please. In the front of the book, uh, Judith Schwartz, who you see on the left, wrote an essay about lesbian photography. She had done a lot of uh, research. She's sitting here with Joan Nessel because she was part of the Lesbian History Archives group. And because I had to self-publish the book because nobody wanted to publish such a book on good paper and I wanted it to be on good paper, 
um, we did not have enough money to put the photographs of other people in the book. Uh, so I decided I would do more research, make a slideshow and go around on my book tour promoting eye to eye with a slideshow of the history of lesbian photography. T. Corinne gave me that idea. It was a great idea. And in next slide, please. In that, in those days, uh, when you did research, it was a little tougher because there was no internet and there were no subject headings called lesbian. So you had to do a lot of reading in between the lines and uh, kind of uh, detective work. And uh, I did that uh, in a lot of different places, a lot of different libraries. Um, and uh, when I could, you know, photography books are expensive. When I could, I, I you know, made the pictures in the libraries. And uh, when I could take the books out, I took them home and I had, next slide, please. I had a copy set up which is, you know, you, you uh, can put your 35 millimeter camera on this stand and then you put the book on the bottom and that's how I made uh, most of the slides. Next, please. But since it was a kind of homemade thing, I, the lights would burn my nose because I would stand there for hours. So I just put this on my nose to keep from getting burned. And uh, that's how I made all the slides for the show. Next, please. Lots and lots of slides. Uh, over 400 slides were in the original uh, version of the show. And um, I took this show on the road and what was supposed to be a short book tour turned into five years of traveling all over the US and a little bit in Canada. And I went to, at, I, I did the show at least 80 times all over the place. And then in 1984, I decided I would stop doing this show because I had made other shows. So I put this show away and next slide. So Can I ask you one question there, Jeb. Sure. When you were presenting over that period of time, yeah, in all these different places, would people come up to you after the show and tell you about more artists that they felt should be there? No, well, what happened was I asked lesbian photographers to tell me if they were making pictures to add to the show, usually, and you have to remember, I'm kind of trying to support myself. So everywhere I went, I would try to do a workshop for photographers and then I would collect work from them. And so the slideshow grew because it, it started with these um, six historical photographers, but I kept adding contemporary photographers. And it was very um, wonderful because when I started, I didn't know there were that many other, you know, women who were making lesbian images. And uh, nobody ever told me about any other historical people because, you know, they weren't doing that research. And I, I did the research. And I found books that other people had researched, like Anne Novotny, who had written the book about Alice Austin, which is how I knew how to go. As you said, the museum didn't exist. Nobody, you know, was talking about her being a lesbian, except Anne, who was a lesbian, who, who wrote that book. So, um, but no, when I gave the show, Mostly what I did was encourage people to photograph and 
if they wanted to just send me their work. I think it's an incredible like snowballing project that's so much about community. And those are things about it that are, are, are just, you know, some of the best kind of information they think that the people can learn about about what happened on this journey. Um, but please go on because I know I interrupted you, but I really wanted no, to know. That's that. okay. I'm happy to be interrupted. I mean, the reason this Dyke show is so important to me and why I worked so very hard to get it digitized is because it's not about me or my work. It's about all of us. It's about all the work that I could find and all of the history that I could find about uh, lesbian photography. And um, yeah, that's what I love about it. How many of us are, are in it and how many people contributed to it. But between 1984, next please, and uh, pretty much um, up until not too long ago, the three boxes of the carousels and cassette tapes of all the shows that I had given and recorded myself just sat in my home somewhere, right? Then um, nothing happened until 2015, a um, curator from uh, Toronto uh, in Canada invited me to do the Dyke Show at a big exhibition they were having for World Pride. And I said, well, I can't give it to you because it's, you know, not in that kind of form. So I gave her a different slideshow that was up on the wall at that exhibit. But then uh, Sophie wrote an article about the Dyke Show for Aperture Magazine, which is really very important photography magazine. And at some point, Ariel Goldberg, who ended up being the curator of the show that actually got the Dyke show digitized, read that article. So that was a key moment. The other very key moment, as uh, Victoria has told you, was June 20th, 2017, when I came to give the keynote at Alice Austin House when it was designated as a site of LGBTQ historical importance, it was basically the museum and Alice coming out to the world. And um, I don't know how you knew about the slideshow to ask me to give that Alice Austin segment. How did you know to was, ask me? It was Kathy Renner. Ah. She connected. She connected the then executive director and uh, Janice Monga with you. Yes. And there had been the Sophie Hackett article. And um, I'm, I'm not sure how you all came to your agreements because, like I said, I was um, in the back room mm -hmm. writing education programs. But um, that, that, that I believe is the connection. I have all the emails around it and it was definitely well, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy definitely um, is responsible for me coming for the keynote. The part I'm not clear about, and I will ask her because it's interesting is, how did you know to ask me to do, do the slideshow? Anyway, we'll find out. That's interesting. We will. Let's investigate that. Kathy might not have known about the slideshow. I think I think so. I really okay. think so. Okay. So then the other thing that, uh, uh, let me see, what's the next slide? Oh, uh, next. Here's the article that was in the, that's the, when the, um, the Sophie article came out. Next. 
this is uh, when we had the big uh, to do at the house with the park rangers and everything because it's the Department of Interior that landmarks uh, things. Okay, next. Okay, so this is the interesting thing that I've never told anybody. So I hadn't given this any part of the slideshow, including the Alice Austin part, since 1984. It was now 2017. I had no script, right? Because I used to just wing it from note cards. So it wasn't like I could go back and look at some old script. I was very busy writing the speech. So what I had to do was listen to the cassette tape on the train and write down what I had said. And I can barely read my own writing that I was writing, you know, the train was moving and I had this, and this headset on writing this thing down. And then I would put the dots everywhere where the thing would change. Anyway, it was crazy. We did it. I had no idea how the reception would be and it was wonderful. So that was a clue. Next, here we are outside. That is the Alice Austin house. That is me somewhere sitting in the crowd with the projector. And um, it was an amazing night. I, okay. I have to say that the, 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 the notes that you had written and the way you unfolded them and the way you did all of that, <laughs> it was completely purposeful to me in the audience. Right. Um, and it was part of, the excitement really yeah. of the slideshow too yeah i said this is the biggest throwback thursday you'll ever have <laughs> <laughs> anyway okay next so this is ariel goldberg and me at the dyke show live in this february but ariel is a wonderful uh researcher academic uh, author, photographer, and curator. And she wanted to see the show. And I said, I'm sorry, there is no show to show you. You know, there's those three boxes and a bunch of cassette tapes. There's no way to show the show. But she, they were very, very... Um, persistent. Ariel and one of her friends finally convinced me that, that they were going to come to my house to see the show. So they came down from New York to my house. I set up a slide projector in the room I'm sitting in now and showed them the show. And then we spent Four years, uh, there's more to say here, trying to get it digitized. And during that time, I uh, thought I was going to move out of this house and I dis and my friend T died and she gave all her work to um, the University of Oregon. Uh, archived her work and I thought oh you know I really should do that because uh, I'm getting old and uh, so I sent all the work uh, except those those three carousels in those boxes I just could not let them go because I kept hoping I would have enough money to get them digitized and then I thought I was going to move out of this house. And I, I drove them up to Smith, which is where I had my archives is at the special collections at Smith College in Massachusetts. And I walked in with the, the three 
boxes and I put them on the desk and I burst into tears. It was, you know, it was so emotional for me to let it go. And I said to them, you must digitize these. That is my dearest wish is that the, these slides get digitized. So fast forward to October, 2021 and Smith College begins the process of digitizing the slides and they finish in February 2022. And part of what uh, spurred that on was that Ariel was uh, curating this show which is the show that is now open at the Leslie Lohman Museum, Images on Which to Build. And they had been a uh, fellow at Smith and had done all the research in my papers before they started <laughs> pursuing me. So Smith knew Ariel. So Ariel was saying they should digitize. I was saying they should digitize. And then they digitized. And next slide. Then began a year of tracking down photographers from 40 years ago to get new releases to use their images in the new slideshow. Because when they originally gave me permission. I was only showing the show to, to women only audiences. And that's what a lot of people gave me permission to do. And the new show was going to be shown to all kinds of audiences. So I had to go back. And it was a very long, next slide, it was a very long process that included using all the social media, using all kinds of searches, you know, those searches that where you pay money and they'll go find the person who owes you the child support. And uh, we were using those <laughs> or anything. And I was astounded that we found almost everybody. It was really amazing. And, uh, um, Leslie Lohman gave, gave me an intern that to help me with that. Uh, Alice, uh, Alice and Elliot helped, and we we used snail mail. We used everything, and we got permission. So I knew which slides, more or less, I would have for the new show next. So then I had to make a new narration. So I got a machine transcription. And if you've ever gotten machine transcriptions, you know they're horrible, right? This one says things like, uh, anyway, you know, it's not really what it, what I said, right? It makes you feel like you mumble because of what they transcribe. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Anyway, I used to give the show and it would take two and a half hours. And I was trying to get it down to an hour. Now you would think that would be hard, but that was easy. You know, that was the miracle of this thing. The first draft that I made of the new script came in at like 58 minutes because all you can see all this much that's on the top got boiled down to two sentences because the new show just gives you the high points. And when I thought I would never have a chance to talk to people ever again, I would tell them everything I knew and more. So next slide. So then we, we had the slides, we had a new narration. The first place the 
show was going to be shown was at the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I wasn't going to, you know, be there. We had a panel discussion, but we got this amazing person, Dia Felix, who you see here sitting in my living room, which we turned into a recording studio. And we got two of my friends to be the audience. And we recorded the basically one hour version of the original show. And that went up on the wall uh, at the CAC in Cincinnati. Um, next slide. And that is what it looked like in Cincinnati. And um, I just received the visitor's book that I asked them to put out. And I was blown away by, by the responses that people in Cincinnati wrote in the visitor's book. So then we could have left it at that. You know, there was the original show digitized with a narration, but big breath here. <laughs> it didn't have the magic of the shows that happened when they were in front of a live audience that I had done 80 times. And I knew that I did not want the forever version of the show to have this studio recording. So I made a lot more work for myself. Of course you did. Yes, I did. Um, I decided I would write an introduction and an epilogue. <laughs> And I would do the show live one more time. It would be my last hurrah. And that's what I did. And uh, we did it, as uh, Victoria told you, at the center in New York. Uh, ne next slide. And uh, this is the great team from Leslie Lohman that helped put on that event. They got this, this is, I learned, this is called the step and repeat, the thing you stand in front of to get your picture taken. Anyway, these wonderful uh, Leslie Lohman people put on this event. It was, um, uh, I don't know where I am now. Oh, ne next slide. Uh, so Dia, our wonderful tech person, who had already synced up the old, um, you know, narration audio, was now recording the live audio at the show. So this is me and Dia trying to figure it out uh, right before the show started. And and uh, I, I can't tell you what how wonderful she is. I mean, she did so much work. Anyway, next, so we we did the show. It was packed out. It was standing room only, only, you know, because it was lesbians, they weren't standing. They were sitting on the floor. But, you know, it was really packed. It was beyond, I'm going to get very emotional. And, and here's the funny thing. I always tell people that I'm emotional and I might cry. I forgot to tell you all that. And and, I, and now I'm getting, <laughs> somebody made me a t-shirt that said I'm the crying kind of butch. And then somebody else, I think I'm getting, it's gonna be on my epitaph. She was a crying kind of butch. But anyway, it's because I care about it a lot, but it was a, it went way beyond all my expectations. And we got a great recording of a great audience. And um, then we had a month between 
the the live show and the opening of the exhibit. And in that month, we D and I had to resync the show and caption it again. And the longer version with the intro and the and the epilogue. So um, I was so sick of hearing my own voice. I cannot tell you how many times I have listened to this show between the first version and this version, but it exists now. Uh, next slide. And can I but, just say, if any of you weren't there for that recording, the energy in the room, the audience was whooping and mm -hmm. chanting and there were so many people that they spilled out onto a whole nother level who were watching it via a live broad broadcast down to them as well. Right. So it really was incredible. It, it was very incredible. So Ariel, who as I say, was really responsible for pushing this to happen. Um, was at the opening with her, with their mother. I apologize for mispronouncing. We do so much lesbian stuff, and I, I, I love Ariel, and they forgive me, but I never forgive myself when I mispronoun them. They were there with their mom. It was a fantastic opening event. Next. This is what it looks like in, in the Leslie Lohman Museum now. And if you go next, there's this lovely little bench where you can sit and put on headphones and hear and watch the whole show. And after the opening event, um, I went with a lot of my friends and family had come to the show. And next slide, we all went out to breakfast together the next day. And I am not, again, going to call their names, but I want people to know you never can do this kind of work this hard work over a long period of time without a very supportive community and a very supportive, uh, this is my family. And uh, so I wanted you to see them. We had a great uh, breakfast. Um, the other thing I wanna say to make it very clear, none of this would exist if there had not been women who were brave enough to be photographed, and if there had not been women who made those photographs. So it is in every way a collective effort. And these audiences in all these little towns and big cities all over uh, the United States, are the ones who supported me to do my work. I never, you know, had grants and residencies or any of that. It was all my work was done because the lesbians wanted to see it and they supported me doing it. So I'm very grateful. I'm extremely glad that it exists. And uh, I am ready for your questions. Okay, Kristen, could you stop screen sharing? Thank you. Oh my goodness, Jeb. I mean, it's just so powerful to hear about, you know, that entire process from the very beginning. Um, you know, when you were, you worked so hard to go and gather these images and find these images and yeah. you know, talk to researchers and do all this research and give this visibility to other women, which would have been, if they weren't photographing at the time, by the time they did your workshop, they yeah. were, you know, so yeah. it, it's a movement. And, um, but to hear about 
the process for this digitization pro project, I think that people often don't actually realize what it has taken for you to do it in the most respectful way, contacting every single contributor to regain new permission agreements is just phenomenal to hear. Um, everyone should, you know, have you as a model um, for this kind of work. It's really, really so important. Um, as Jeb said, we're opening it up for questions and, you know, you could unmute yourself. You could put a question in the chat. Um, we have a few minutes and I'm always happy to go just a few minutes over if somebody has a question. I feel like Jeb was incredibly thorough, but um, I can't necessarily see. I can go to a gallery view to see you all. Um, if you would like to unmute or raise a hand, I recognize lots of names in the audience. Um, someone, oh, Michaela Griffo, um, who is also an incredible artist, said that last week uh, she sat alone in the Leslie Lohman Museum with the Dyke Show, and she would like to just say that you are not the only Butch Dyke who cried, Jeb. <laughs> um, and she just wishes to thank you and um for the gift that you've given the community um you know I think that there's this whole generation of young dykes out there that are so appreciative of of this work I have a question from Eileen Muller I hope I've said your surname correctly um uh I am curious to hear about the venues and the dike spaces where you showed the slideshow in the in the 80s. How did you find spaces? Who ran them? And what was it like to encounter these local communities? Well, you know, we were building a whole alternative culture. So we, and when I say we, I mean the musicians and the poets and the photographers, we all were working sort of together with um, production groups that we would kind of put together in these different places, right? So if, if I showed you my little packet, it taught production groups how to do a press release, how to rent a space, how to make a, you know, there was a template for the flyer, you know, so the musicians were doing that, I was doing that, we were all, and then we had some really amazing production groups that would just keep bringing all kinds of, you know, lesbian culture into their uh, cities, but it was a process, you know, we were all uh, figuring it out and, and learning together. And the venues were very interesting. <laughs> you know, I did this show in dirty garages and Elks Halls and church basements and you name it. If there was a space that you could possibly rent, you know, I gave a show there. Now, eventually what happened was we started or I, I started and really all of us started getting gigs at universities because at a certain point in the 80s, the students started organizing, um, you know, LGBTQ type groups. They were called something else then, but, you know, um, and they would, you know, bring you. So you didn't um, have to sleep in somebody's guest room where the cats usually slept and you were allergic to cats as I was, which is a very bad thing to be if you are a traveling lesbian. And I would tell people I'm, I'm allergic and then they would vacuum just before I came. So all the dander would be up in the air just as I arrived. So I stopped telling people that I was allergic. I mean, you know, it's an occupational hazard. What can you say? And then 
you know, as things got better, you know, when we got these university gigs, usually you could stay in a dorm space or a, a motel or something. But, um, you know, it was very grassroots. What can I say? A, a name, a kind of a place. And uh, I've given a show there. I even slept on somebody's massage table once. That was one of the places I slept. Um, You're very resilient. I have to say that. Well, I was young. Resourceful, resilient, all of those things. I have another question, Jeb. Okay. It's, uh, it's about the Alice Austin photographs. And this person is a researcher of queer history. Um, okay. and, and they wondered if, the Austin photographs were the oldest ones you discovered? Um, no. The six uh, people who are in my uh, show, who are the historical people, are Lady Clementina Howarden, who's uh, from the UK. Hi, Barbara. And um, Emma Jane Gay. Francis Benjamin Johnston, Edith Watson, all of those people are precede Alice mm -hmm. in time. So then there's Alice and after her is Bernice Abbott, who was alive at the time I was doing the show. And Bernice Abbott was in fact, one of the original friends of Alice Austin before we yes. were in the museum. Now I have three raised hands. Um, so I'm just gonna call you an order of what's on the screen. And I think that's about all we have time for. You've mm -hmm. all been amazing. So I wondered if I could ask Stone, if you could unmute. Hi, um, hi Jeb, thank you so much uh, for all of the um, information you share with the community and the work you've done. Um, I also am a lesbian photographer. I just uh, finished my BFA thesis exhibition actually. And I've been wondering since I started at my school here, uh, why there are so many lesbian photographers. It's a trend I've, I've noticed. And I was wondering if you just had any thoughts on like why you thought that might be or why we might be drawn to the medium. Are we talking about any particular time period? Uh, I mean, I've noticed even uh, it's just spanning. Uh, my generation of my classes have, uh, not my personal year, but younger classes have had more. Um, and yeah, it just is something I've noticed um, since entering the art world. Well, congratulations on getting your BFA. Thank um, you. I would, turn the question back to you because you're a young person. For, for me, I think um, when these people who I just named, the historical people started, most of them were the first women in doing this in all their fields, you know, like the first photojournalist, the first, you know, um, uh, person to, uh, well, Bernice Abbott did scientific photography, you know, people did all kinds of things. But anyway, what I think is, um, I can only really talk personally, because I think everybody does it for a different reason. I did it because I wanted to show that lesbians exist. And at the time that I did it, photography, people believed it. I mean, now with AI, you can make anything look like it exists. Uh, even before AI, we, you know, Photoshop makes things, you know, during my lifetime, photographs lost the credibility that they had had uh, with the early, you know, documentary uh, photographers. So to me, there were two major reasons that I chose photography. One was I didn't have any other artistic skill. I can't paint, I can't draw, <laughs> you know, and I could, I could do photography. And, and the other was because I thought if I showed real lesbians, people would have to believe it. 
Thank you. But so much. That was just for that time period. Why people do it now, you have to tell me. Um, I think similar reasons actually still even. I, I as well, have always been drawn to the arts, but haven't, um, or photography is the most accessible. And then also still trying to prove to people that we exist somehow. <laughs> yeah. It's like, always I ongoing. I'm going to take the last two questions, Jeb. Um, sure. So we're going to hear from Claire. Yeah, hi. Thank you so, so much. I mean, the Dyke Show is so important to me. I'm a lesbian art historian, also just about to complete my bachelor's degree. And like the research that you did with the Dyke Show helps me so much in my work still today. So thank you wow. a thousand times for all of that. Um, I, well, my question is kind of simple. I'm wondering why you decided to call it the Dyke Show. Like mm -hmm. if you could have chose anything, why, why that title? Because like, I feel like it's really stuck and like test, lasted the test of time. Well, the actual title was not The Dyke Show. The actual title was uh, Lesbian Photography, 18, whatever it was, to whatever year I was showing it. So it was like, you know, whatever it was, 1898 to 1982, uh, 1898 to 1983, what, you know, and so it was lesbian images and photography, and then the dates. Well, that's kind of long. And everybody called it the Dyke Show. I did not make that choice. It just in the culture became the Dyke Show because the other thing was too much. And when we decided to do the new version, I said to everybody, we just are going to forget the lesbian images and photography thing. We're just going to call it the Dyke Show because that's how people know it. Thank you. That was a great, great question. Um, Annabelle, our final question. Hello. Um, thank you for speaking today and for all of the work that you've done. I have sort of a practical question. Um, I think the Dyke Show is so important to lesbian history. And obviously it's up right now at the Leslie Lohman Museum. But I was wondering if there are plans from that museum or from you to have it be publicly available. Um, I know some things on their website, they get digitized in like their collection and are available through their website, but I don't think everything is, but I wasn't sure. So I was just wondering, like, is it going to be publicly available to people who didn't get to come to New York to see? Well, as you might guess, my deepest desire is that it be freely available to everyone online. But because there are a lot of fingers in the pie now of people who contributed to the digitizing and making of it, there are some things that have to get worked out. So that is my goal. Uh, I think eventually we'll get there. Stay tuned. Um, you know, uh, Leslie Lohman is acquiring one version of the Dyke Show as a piece of art that will be in their permanent collection. It won't always be on view, but it will be there. Um, other museums, I hope, will also acquire it. Um, maybe the Alice Austin Museum has like, thought about it. We <laughs> can't say for sure, but there's a lot of stuff that has to happen. And, uh, uh, you know, I I have never, you know, uh, expected, uh, well, I'll just say that. Stay tuned. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeb. And thank you, everyone that joined us today. And thank you for your thoughtful questions and comments. Um, there was one quite funny response to lesbian attraction to the camera was that um, perhaps cameras are butch. Um, ah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you've all been absolutely fantastic. This has been recorded this evening, so it will become available um, 
really by tomorrow um, and we'll be sending out the link and we'll be putting it, a link on our website um, so that all of these important pieces to what is a, a really massive story around this incredible um, performative piece of work and um, uh, you know, uh, research and so many different ways you could describe it. Um, uh, you know, can be can be available. It's great to hear that there was art historical scholars here and and whatnot tonight, because um, that's what we we aim to do. And um, also, you know, as I say, huge shout out to the Leslie Lohman Museum. And if you are in New York, please. Go oh, and I have one other thing. Yeah, one other thing. So when I made the epilogue, I only added um, photographers who were no longer alive. And so there are a lot of really amazing people who are doing work now. And one of them is my buddy, Lola Flash, who just had a book published called Believable. Everybody should find and buy this book. It's amazing. Also, hi, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Jeb. And thank you to Kristen from the Alice Austin House for helping us with tech tonight. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Everybody. Lots of love. Bye.